Good evening, everybody. We are live on The Dentist Show. It's Sunday and it's Social Sundays. You know, Sundays is a time for us to talk about social issues, issues that affect our community. Now, as I wait for all of you to join The Dentist Show tonight, um, for me, I just want to see how everybody is doing. Please don't forget that it's still COVID. So you must be making sure that you are still hand washing, you are still wearing your mask, and you are still social distancing. Um, it's really important that as we, you know, try and take steps during this COVID-19, we don't forget to wear our masks, wash our hands, and social distance as much as possible as we can. Now, I've got Tonight, we're talking about how to fight prostate cancer, the causes, the symptoms, the risk reduction and prevention. I've got top people that are going to be joining me today on the show. I've got Susan Pippa. She's from Prostate Cancer UK. I've got Dr. Joseph and I have a survivor, Dr. Kwame Opong, also joining us on tonight's show. Now... I know you're eagerly waiting um, for us to talk about this topic. Hello. I hope everybody's doing well as well. Please, please, please don't forget that when you are watching the show, please share your pages. Make sure that, you know, it's not only you that is indulging in good information, information that's going to educate you. All you have to do is click that share button. Let somebody else hear this message you know it's really important prostate cancer is something that we don't talk about enough um someone said to me it's a silent killer um you know and you know a lot of men don't go to the hospitals for checkups why is the reason and you know we're going to be talking about all of that all of that all of that all of that um but i must say Big thank you to our sponsors, as always. A big thank you to World Remit. You can join over 5.7 million people across the world who are sending money back home to a loved one. All you have to do is go to www.worldremit.com and you can send money back home in minutes, very fast. In you know, and just they just get the number on their mobile. Um, they get the money on their mobile money, and that is it. Pay for your school fee fees pay for someone to go to the hospital, whatever it is, use World Remit um, to do that. And again, I want to say a big thank you to this amazing young lady that's come out with this amazing perfume. Um, there you go. There's a website details. Gloria Mills, make sure you go out there and purchase this amazing perfume, which I've got myself. It smells absolutely amazing. I've got one here. Look. So there's the other one as well. Absolutely amazing. Young girl, uh, we must be supporting each other. So make sure that you go online. There's her website details. That's her email and order one today. Okay. And again, I must say a big thank you to A, my special one, Jalof Seasoning, her shito. Everything is so on point, guys. Go online again and purchase this amazing spices by Cassie's Classics. Um, it's amazing. You will thank me later. Make sure that you give me feedback on all of these things. And again, to Vesta London Beauty for this amazing lip gloss, which I'm wearing at the moment. Make sure again that you go online and support this initiative and support everyone that's doing amazing things. Let's support each other. Um, so again, back to the topic. Let me see where everybody is. Hello, Joyce. Hello, Juliet. Um, Sarkas is on. Um, if you are live and you are watching me from your house, please let me, you know, let me see you. Say a little hi. I hope that everybody is doing well. And again, don't forget to share your pages. Um, it's really important that we do so. Okay. So I'm going to introduce my guests onto the show today. Um, let me, I'm going to introduce Susan first. So Susan Pippa. Um, amazing woman. I've just met her literally and we've just vibed. Um, she's a nurse specialist from the UK. Pippa, it's an honor to have you on the show today. It is an honor to be here. So, good evening. Um, maybe not good evening in, in the other sort of countries that this broadcast is going out to, but it's, it's, it's wonderful to be with you all. Thank, Thank you. For us. 
Thank you, Susan. Susan, tell us a bit more about what you do. Um, I know you work with um, Prostate um, Cancer UK. How long have you been doing that? And you know, tell us a bit about yourself. Okay, so um, I'm a qualified nurse of many, many years standing. So I, I've worked around 34 years in the NHS. Wow. Um, yes, absolutely. And I'm here to tell the tale and I wouldn't have changed any bit of that, to be honest. Um, that's given me a very good all round experience, um, especially in working with patients with cancer. Um, and then I decided that I would have a change and I became aware of a fantastic organisation called Prostate Cancer UK, who are a charitable organisation, um, who have a very simple ambition, and this is to stop men from dying from prostate cancer. And they offer very special support service. They use qualified nurses, and we're able to provide information which is current and evidence-based, and also support, we're a team, and men and their loved ones can contact us if they are worried about their risk of prostate cancer or they have a diagnosis of prostate cancer. We can talk them through their treatment options to enable them to go forward to make choices which are the most appropriate for them. And very importantly, offer this emotional support, which is so crucial. And as I say, that's also extended to the loved ones. So we have wives, brothers, daughters who contact us too. So we're contactable by phone. We also have email and social media contacts as well. Um, and it's wonderful. We also get the opportunity to teach healthcare professionals so that they have a greater understanding of prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we get to work with a fantastic organisation um, and it's a sort of a well-oiled organisation that works really, really well. Um, we welcome the opportunity to be raising the profile and the awareness of prostate cancer, particularly amongst the black communities. Mm -hmm. So this is why we're so delighted that you've invited us tonight. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And this is definitely a topic that we should be talking about um, yeah, so um, we do have some contacts from people from um, overseas, but it's just very important just to say that we can only give information in relation to treatments and care with prostate cancer in the UK. Okay, okay, okay. And why is that? Is that because you're able to have contact with the patient or...? Well, we're a UK-based charity. Okay. Um, and so... To be honest with you, Denta, there is so much work to be done. You know, yeah. we have the government level to drive change. So you can imagine, you know, and of course, we invest millions into research to try and find better ways of diagnosing prostate cancer, better treatments, better support. And of course, you know, the, the urology community works very, very well on an international sort of level. And so, you know, we, when things are normal, we attend overseas conferences, etc. And the work, you know, the, the research, the money that we put into research, when we, when we, when we sort of find sort of um, information that's going to make these positive changes, of course, that's shared with, the, with, with a wider population. But to be honest with you, also, we don't have an understanding of, for example, how in Ghana, how the healthcare system works. And you mm. can find that actually um, the way that we treat uh, prostate cancer can vary when you go to country to country. True, absolutely, you're absolutely right. So I really appreciate you being on today. I'm gonna to introduce Dr. Joseph um, on as well, who is in the USA, so it's global today. Um, and you know, Doc is a urologist. Doc, if you don't mind, just to tell us a little bit about what you do and you know, um, you know, why did you choose urology? Uh, hello, first of all, I just want to thank you for having me on the show as well. Uh, it is good afternoon here, and uh, it was a pleasant surprise to be connected with you through a mutual colleague of mine. So I appreciate you having us here um, to discuss such an important topic and one that's often overlooked. But ironically, you know, we're talking about prostate cancer, which is the number one most common cancer in men. Um, so you think that it would typically have a little bit more um, spotlight on it, but not typically. So uh, it's a great opportunity. As you had mentioned, I'm a 
a urologist. I'm at, currently at the University of Minnesota Medical Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. In my final year of training, I'm prepping to go into individual practice. Um, and as a urologist, uh, we are involved in the treatments of numerous uh, GU conditions. So cancer is notwithstanding, we also treat kidney stones, incontinence, um, and uh, work with spinal cord patients and patients who have abnormalities in terms of their bladder function. But going back to the cancer, we do prostate cancer treatment, of course, is a big uh, component of our um, repertoire. And we do a lot of uh, discussion with patients, counseling on patients, um, surgical intervention, either robotic or open. Um, we counsel them on systemic therapies such as chemotherapy and hormone therapy. And oftentimes we counsel them on just observation in terms of managing and watching these cancers over time. And we also take care of the patients after they've had intervention to continue to follow them to make sure that we catch any signs of disease recurrence. Um, in terms of why I chose urology, I think that one thing about urology and prostate cancer, as uh, she had alluded to, is that um, in the African-American community particularly, there are some discrepancies that have been well documented in the research. And these discrepancies include things like delayed diagnosis in African-American men, uh, delayed uh, treatment in African-American men, and poor outcomes. And, you know, of mm. course, uh, it is easy to attribute these to genetics, but there are some social, economic, and preventable causes that uh, the research I've been involved in and the research that um, uh, my co-residents and staff have been involved in is aiming to mitigate. So I think that was one thing that re that uh, spoke to me. And uh, the field of urology is very vast. Um, there is very uh, much uh, options in terms of how you want to structure your practice and the type of cases you want to do. And I do like working in terms of men's health because I think that, as you also alluded to, a lot of men are very reluctant to seek treatments. Um, so it's it's been an opportunity of mine as a provider of color to be able to reach out to men who maybe otherwise would have foregone treatment or would not have uh, uh, considered treatments. So we do things like barbershop outreach, for example, to reach these uh, populations who normally would avoid the doctor. And of course, like I said, it's a detriment to them, especially uh, given that uh, we've documented that they can sometimes have worse outcomes. Okay. Um, so when you meet, you, you do um, barbershop outreach, what, what what exactly do you do? So it's, you know, sometimes uh, when we, uh, we can go out to places like barbershops, for example, where men are, you know, just out there um, speaking, hanging oh, out and waiting oh, to get their haircuts. <laughs> but it's a good, it's a good setting so, in a sense. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'll it's say a good it's a good setting. place. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's a good setting in terms of having that casual conversation in a non-medical setting to just get the information out there and to bridge that gap so people are more, you know, um, willing to see providers because a lot of times there are, there is the issue of not being able to relate to your provider. And, you know, I'm in the privileged position of being able to reach out to uh, patients who, you know, not necessarily would not have providers like me uh, uh, commonly. Um, so I think that's kind of one thing I do like about it and the fact that I can reach out to these particular populations. Okay, thank you so much, Doc. Before I bring on um, Dr. Kwame Opong, I just want to talk about, you know, what, you know, what does it mean for something to be cancerous, Doc? So I think when we think about cancer broadly, you know, uh, essentially what happens with the majority of cancers is you have a healthy cell and for some reason, there's an alteration in the genetic material of that cell. So the cell is no longer functioning like a normal cell, and it now has the potential to grow uncontrollably. And as it grows uncontrollably, it starts to displace normal cells. It starts to take away their resources. And this is what can cause some of the symptoms you can see in cancer, the more widespread symptoms. In addition, some of these abnormal cells can also produce uh, certain substances and chemicals which can further exacerbate these symptoms. So when we say something is cancerous, it's essentially meaning that it was a cell that was once normal, has been converted to an abnormal cell and is now growing uncontrollably and uh, causing uh, a wide array of detrimental effects to the patient.
Thank you so much, Doc. Um, what are some of the um, other characteristics that you know one will find when they have prostate cancer? How would you know? So it is tricky, and I think you had alluded to calling it the, the silent killer because I would say that in the majority of cases, particularly early in the disease course, it's very hard to find any symptoms whatsoever. Uh, you only will typically see symptoms such as back pain, involuntary weight loss, uh, loss of appetite, fatigue, um, bone pain in a very late course of disease. So typically we like to catch people when they're asymptomatic and this is why um, primary care providers will do things like uh, screening for prostate cancer, uh, which will typically start in uh, you know, the ranges, but from 50 to 60 years old. Um, and this is just, we can discuss this a little bit further, uh, of course, but this is just a way of catching this disease because as you met, as I kind of alluded to it, it is asymptomatic in a lot of the cases. And even in some more advanced cases, it can still be asymptomatic. Okay. Um, Susan, typically, um, is, is it curable prostate cancer? Yes, I mean, prostate cancer isn't just one disease. It can come in many forms. So as Dr. Joseph has mentioned, if we are lucky enough to catch that prostate cancer early, when the prostate cancer is still within the prostate, so it might be a good idea just to say that the prostate is a gland, which is just below the bladder. So if you imagine like a ring donut um, encircling a hollow tube, that is the prostate that sits just below that bladder. And its purpose, in actual fact, just to quickly say, is to produce the, the seam and the liquid to enable the sperm to travel, basically. That's its main function. Okay. Um, and men that were assigned a, a male at birth will have a prostate, but it's also just important just to touch that trans women, and we may have some black trans women listening, even if they have genital reconstruction surgery, they will still have a prostate. But I'm going to talk about men just because they they, they are our, our, our main our main um, um, sufferers. Yeah. Um, so yes, it is treatable, um, especially when we're able to catch the prostate cancer when it's still within the prostate or just broken outside of the prostate's outer covering. Okay, so within the proximity, within the 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 you know sort of lower abdomen within the pelvis. Okay, um, and we have a very high success rate in treating those cancers. And in actual fact, Denta, it's very interesting that um, prostate cancer is typically very slow growing, not always, but more commonly so. And some men who are found to have a slow growing prostate cancer, but it's still within their prostate, may be able to very safely postpone treatment. It's called active surveillance, where the man is very closely monitored, but can postpone treatment or in some cases may never actually require any treatment or not okay. treatment for some years. But yes, it's very treatable and uh, we have a very high success rate of treating, and we call it localised prostate cancer, when the prostate cancer is still within the prostate or locally advanced when it's just outside of the prostate. And for the majority of those cancers, yes, it's very treatable. It becomes a different problem so the, tr the treatment that we tend to give for those sorts of cancers are what we call with a curative intent meaning that the treatment is aimed at getting rid of the cancer but unfortunately it is a smaller percentage but there are still those men who have a more of an aggressive prostate cancer aggressive meaning that the cancer has the ability to multiply and grow more quickly and that potential to leave the prostate and when the cancer has been able to do that and when it's able to reach distant areas of the body, we call that advanced prostate cancer. Unfortunately, then, our efforts are not to try and get rid of the cancer because sadly we're unable to do so. But actually with advanced prostate cancer, it is to control that cancer. But recent developments over the last five years or so have improved the prognosis even for those men with advanced prostate cancer. So the, 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 the idea is to control as opposed to get rid of in advanced. But yes, it's a very treatable cancer when we can catch it early enough. Okay. Can you go through some of the treatment um, options that we have for, for our men? 
don't I, is it okay for me just to answer that or both, both of us? Yes, I'll get both of your opinions from my okay. different so the, the, the thing that I mentioned where we can postpone treatment for some lucky patients is something called active surveillance. And that's very much recognized as a very safe option, as I say, for men with slow growing localized within the prostate cancer. Now, when it is deemed appropriate that that man's well-being may be at risk if they do not have treatment, they are generally given treatment options. And generally in the UK, they would consist of actual surgery. We call that a radical prostatectomy, where the prostate itself is surgically removed. OK, so that is one option. Another sort of gold standard option would be radiotherapy to the prostate, which is actually gland, okay. um, sometimes with hormone therapy, which lowers or blocks the circulating male sex hormone testosterone. Okay. Um, so, those treatments, so, so, sorry. Go back. So when you remove it sometimes, does, is it likely to come back? Just like we know in breast cancer that, you know, sometimes it gets removed or you have therapy and it can come back. Is that the same for um, prostate cancer? Well, we have really good success in okay. managing prostate cancer within the prostate okay. um, with either of these options of treatment. But unfortunately, it is always potentially um, a possibility that that cancer could return. But that would be very much looking at the individual. So they would be taking things into account, such as the staging, that's where the cancer has been found. That would be looking at um, how aggressive that cancer is. So the more aggressive the cancer, then the more likely the possibility of that cancer reoccurring in the future. However, having said that, you know, yes, we commonly see men um, and have contact with men who have had surgery or radiotherapy and hormone therapy and are quite happy living their lives some number of years. Um, and we have an almost 100% survival rate at five years oh. with these cancers. So I'm not saying that that's the minimum age that they will live to, uh, live to. It will go on from there and sort of late 80s for 10 years for men with that sort of cancer. So yes, we have very, very high success with these sorts of treatments. Fantastic. Doc, is it the same types of treatment? Oh, have you finished your treatments, um, Susan? Or is there more? There, 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 there are others which aren't um, quite as often. One might be um, something called brachytherapy, where radioactive seeds are implanted within the prostate. So they deliver the, 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 the radiotherapy um, in a smaller area. So sometimes there was fewer side effects. So that would be suitable for some men. But they are really sort of the gold standards. And there are others that are more sort of, um, we don't have the large enough studies to look at the outcomes to say, yes, these are comparable to these gold standards recommended treatments that we use. So yeah, really I would say that the options are typically surgery or with the radiotherapy or radiotherapy and hormone therapy or active surveillance, the postponement of treatment for some lucky men. Okay, fantastic. Doc, is it the same for you? Do we have, or do you have other treatments that you do in the USA? No, I think that as she had mentioned, there's a lot of overlap between how we approach treatment because essentially it's split into either observation, surgery, or radiation with the combination of hormone therapy, assuming that the disease is localized. And what I mean by that is that it's within the prostate alone. Once there is an evidence that the disease has spread um, through either imaging or after we've sent surgical pathology, or if the blood tests suggest that this disease is widespread, then our focus is not necessarily on treatment, but more on palliation and controlling the disease. And by doing that, that's when we're talking about more chemotherapy and hormone therapy as indicated, but that can differ from patient to patient. But essentially as urologists, our focus of course is the surgical intervention. And what the surgical intervention entails is, as she mentioned, radical prostatectomy. Uh, in the US, we approach radical prostatectomy two ways, either doing the surgery robotically or doing the surgery in a traditional open approach where we do the normal incisions and everything. And um, in the US, you know, for robotic surgery, the turnover is about one day. So the patient will have their surgery and usually be discharged a day after. 
Um, for an open surgery, however, it may be a little bit longer because we have to make bigger incisions. Um, but those are generally the treatments that we offer. Sometimes we do a combination of treatments. So for example, a patient who has very severe disease that is still localized, will take out the prostate. And then after the prostate is taken out, we'll also give them radiation after that. Um, and that once again, depends on the individual characteristics of the disease. Um, between surgery and radiation, they do have similar outcomes, at least from the studies that we have here. Uh, that being said, with surgery, you have the option of doing radiation after. However, if you do radiation first, typically a lot of urologists will not proceed with surgery after that because it makes the surgery very technically difficult. Okay, okay. And, and Doc, and Susan, what ages are you getting people coming in with prostate cancer, especially in our community? Have you seen younger people get it now? What's the age bracket that people usually get prostate cancer? Um, so typically prostate cancer, uh, you know, it's traditionally considered an older person's disease, um, which is why a lot of times we start screening at 55 and above, um, depending on your, your conversations with your primary care provider. Um, that being said, there are some people who have genetic predisposition to prostate cancer. So one of the things that we'd like to make sure we investigate is family history. Um, for example, if your father had prostate cancer at 55, you are at a high risk of prostate cancer. And typically the guidelines would recommend we start screening you 10 years before the diagnosis of your father. So 55, if he had it, we'd start screening you at 45. So we definitely have some people who are in the younger age range in their 40s who can have prostate cancer, but typically it's because of a family history or sometimes there are genetic conditions that predispose you to particular types of cancers. Um, but I would say the majority of patients are usually uh, late 50s uh, to 60s. And uh, these are usually the patients that we have these discussions with. Um, one caveat to that is that we have to be, you know, we use some um, some uh, context too, because if you have a patient who is very unhealthy and might not tolerate surgery, then we typically try to encourage things like systemic therapy, because it is still surgery. It still carries a risk of anesthesia, of bleeding, of infection. So that's another thing that goes into um, whether we treat a patient regardless of age. And of course, we do say that we stop screening after the age of 70. That does not mean that somebody over the age of 70 is disqualified from receiving treatment, particularly if the patient is otherwise healthy and doing well and has a life expectancy of at least uh, 10 years. We're not going to deny them surgery because they are in an older age bracket where typically you wouldn't be looking for cancer. Mm. Why do you think, uh, oh, and uh, Susan, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I think it, it, it might be sort of helpful to mention that, unfortunately, what we sometimes see is that uh, black men can be diagnosed um, earlier than 50. Um, I would say, sorry, please excuse me. Um, so um, from maybe the age of 45 upwards, and it might be interesting to touch on the differences between, as you say, doctor, about sort of screening, because... Um, in the UK, we have a big concern about prostate cancer with our black communities. This is really, really worth putting this point out here. So in the UK, on average, one in eight men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer. Wow. We look at black men of both African and um, Afro-Caribbean origin, that is one in four so that's very very concerning and it'd be very interesting to hear um whether that is a similar statistic in the us um so typically we see prostate diagnosed most commonly in the age group of 65 to 69 we don't have a screening program in the uk wow. instead you don't know no, absolutely and one of the reasons for that is because we don't necessarily have um, the scientific knowledge to be able to having a, a screening program, a national screening program. Remember, we're testing well men, essentially. Um, so there's got to be various criteria that, that will reach 
and the test needs to be specific and sensitive enough to be able to identify those who are particularly high risk. Um, so um, we use um, a blood test called a PSA, which is prostate specific, but not cancer specific. So it can tell us that there may be a problem with the prostate, but can't tell us in isolation whether a man has cancer or not. But in the UK at present, the only way that we can manage this is now that we know that black men are in that high risk group. And as doctor has alluded to, um, the other risk groups are aged. So the older the man gets, the more likely they are to have a prostate cancer diagnosis. And as doctor said, a family history, especially if it's a first line relative, so that's brother, um, father, son, and maybe inc again um, increase that risk if your relative was diagnosed under the age of 60 as well. So wow. what we would like black men, we don't advise that every man go and have a PSA done. It has to be something that's very much informed choice. But because black men are in this high risk group in the UK, men with no symptoms at all are entitled between the ages of 50 and 69 to go to speak to their GP and request this PSA level that I'm talking about. And these are men with no symptoms, okay? But what we've got to be very careful with here is knowing that black men can be diagnosed slightly earlier than their white counterparts. As an organization, and many healthcare professionals feel that black men should be having this conversation earlier from 45. But the problem is that it, it doesn't mean that it's their right to request this. But what we would like to see men do is maybe to have a look at our information on our website, Prostate Cancer UK, there's fantastic information there. Maybe print that off, maybe take that to their GP to make sure that their GP, their healthcare professional, is aware of this increased risk. This is significant. And this is the way to drive change because it's not necessarily the GPs trying to be difficult. I'm sure you find that the same doctor in the US, you know, they have to know a little bit about many, many subjects, but these things are key, but we can't allow this high risk group to, you know, to go unnoticed or maybe because the doctor is under a bit of a misconception that black men are at high risk. Unfortunately, we've got to encourage that man to try and make that change. And again, if a man is worried about their prostate cancer risk, they'd be very welcome to call us if they're having difficulty in getting a GP to listen to them and accept their high risk. Um, but why is it high in black men? What is the reason? What are we doing wrong? What, what, what is the reasons why it's high in, in, in black people? Well, in truth, we don't know why, okay? In truth, this, this, this is the sad thing. Now, there's been a lot of research that has gone on um, in the UK, in the US, because we realize this is such a significant problem. And there were, you know, there were too many families within our black communities which are harmed due to prostate cancer. And obviously you would think that there may be a genetic connection here that's 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 of course a possibility but we haven't been able to identify that um there hasn't been enough evidence for us to to, to to gain even more from this knowledge and this is incredibly important that we try and learn why black men are risk because until we know that we can't um find better diagnostic testing to identify those at at considerable risk and uh, we can't tailor our treatments to be specific. If there was a genetic connection here, we need to be able to identify that. And Dan, if you don't mind, um, this might be a very good time just to mention something. I'm afraid this is just for men in the UK, mm -hmm. but this is, this is, I'm calling out here to black men in the UK who are healthy. We are part funding a study, um, which is called a profile study. Okay. Then, men who are at risk. So they're looking at um, white men who have family history of prostate cancer who are healthy, but they're also looking very, very specifically at black men. And these are black men from the ages of 40 to 69 of either African or West Indian descent. 
okay? And there are some criteria in that um, these men must have um, both parents and all four grandparents of the same ethnic origin. And basically, they are looking to see how uh, genetic testing may play a role in trying to put together the development of screening programs for detecting prostate cancer. So this is crucial that if we can find out more information as to um, how genetics um, may be involved in black men being at this higher risk in this high risk group, then this means that we'll be able to predict the person's risk of cancer better, um, make a better diagnosis and treat cancer better. So this had been, and clinical trials had been temporarily put on hold due to the COVID-19 outbreak. But I just found out very, very late on Friday afternoon that actually this very important piece of research, which is called the profile study. So healthy black men out there, if you want to make a difference, to the future and if you all give you the ability to be assessed yourself because what they're doing is they are taking they're doing blood testing psa testing but they're also looking at tissue testing as well um it's not something that you have to have but they'll discuss certain men might benefit from mri which is imaging um and also prostate biopsy again this isn't something that you know you, you would have to consent to that you don't have to have that but it would mean that you would be able to be monitored yourself because this would be over a five year time frame from age 40. Mm. So actually this is crucial research. Um, so is it is it okay, Denta, if if I say that um, yes, if please. men in the UK are interested, thank you so much. If they could please make contact by email. Um, this is the researchers from the Institute of Cancer Research in London, okay, which we mm. are part funding. The email is or lowercase, prostate.research mm -hmm. at okay. rmh.nhs.uk. And there's one other thing, um, men would be able to have to travel to the Royal Marsden, um, either in London or Sutton, which is Surrey way, just to mention that. Um, but I wouldn't be frequent attendant for this, but I just thought that's very important to mention that because they, they're having difficulty in recruiting black men to, to take No, it. that's brilliant. And we will share that information. Um, I've just said hi in our private chat. If you don't mind texting the website details so I can put it up on the screen, um, that would be very helpful. I've just said hi in the private chat. I don't know if you've seen that. That's Thank you where so much. Um, Thank you. Details, yeah, and I will share that, and we will share it on our database as well. Um, because what we did find again is that lucky for us, we've got you know, um, Kwame Opong, Dr. Kwame Opong on who is a survivor of it, but it was very difficult for me to find somebody, a man that's been through it, that would openly talk about it. And just as it's not openly for them to go to the doctors, um, to have a blood test, and you know, it was very, very, very for me to find somebody to come and speak on this topic. And so I think that now I will bring on um, um, Dr. Kwame Opong to share his story and to share you know, what he's been through um, and how he has been a survivor. So guys, please welcome Dr. Kwame Opong Anani. Good evening, Doc. Can you hear me? Yes, I do. Oh, brilliant. Do, do you hear Fantastic. me? Yes, I can. I can. Oh. oh. Doc? Dr. Kwame, can you hear me? Your screen has gone off. Yeah. Oh, I think his reception has just gone. Hello. Off. Yes, I. Doc, oh. can you hear me? Well, yeah, it's unfortunate. Yeah, unfortunate. Yeah. Well, let, let, yes, I do hear. 
Okay, but your screen has gone off. I can't see your face anymore. Sometimes the reception is bad. Um, I'm hopefully going to get him back on so that he can share his story with us because I think it's really important for the men to hear yeah. this. Um, um, but what I, you know, before you know, he comes on. What are the what habits can a person embrace in order to limit the risk of ever contacting a prostate cancer? Well. Um... You know, we have, there's a lot of conflicting research as to how to limit the risk. Um, you know, a simple search will bring about a host of recommendations, um, anywhere from lifestyle changes like exercise to decreasing dairy intake to increasing vegetable intake to decreasing red meat. And essentially when I talk to patients and they ask this question, I say, if it's good for your heart, it's probably good for your prostate. Um, because a lot of these uh, recommendations are the same recommendations you're going to get with regards to improving your cardiovascular health. And I think, you know, it underscores the importance of that because, yes, we talk about cancer, but the number one killer of Black men is cardiovascular disease um, and Black women as well. And I think that, you know, the same recommendations you would typically hear are the same recommendations you would give um, Okay, thank you so much. Is that the same for you, Susan? Yes, the only thing that I would add, absolutely, doctor, absolutely, um, is, is, is it's important to maintain as best you can a healthy weight because although we're not aware that obesity itself cause you to have prostate cancer. What we do sometimes find is that if you're particularly obese, then you are more likely to be diagnosed with a more aggressive or advanced disease on that first diagnosis. So just trying to maintain that as long as the other um, healthy lifestyle measures that doctors mentioned um, are, 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 are absolutely, that, 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 that's it. And it's a question we get asked a lot. Is that the same for you, doctor? Yeah. Yes, and uh, to your point about obesity, uh, you know, obviously we are talking about prevention, but for patients who need treatment, um, robotic treatment is typically not available if you're very obese. And surgery is much more high risk when you're very obese. So if it does come to the unfortunate incident, uh, incident where you are diagnosed, uh, having your weight healthy prior to that does make your risk of complications from surgery and treatment much, much lower. Okay. Thank you so much. I think now we have um, Dr. Kwame back. Hi, Doc. Hello. Okay, fantastic. Hello. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you so Hello. much for joining Doc, I can hear you. Hello. Yeah. Hello, Doc. That's a pleasure. Yeah. Yes. Doc, tell us a bit about your journey and how you came to find out that you had prostate cancer. Well, I didn't really seem to have any symptoms as such, but on a regular blood test in about uh, in 2205, I realized that my PSA was high. So I had further tests done. But as I said, I didn't have any problem whatsoever. But then when I check up again from 2205 to 2018, my PSA had risen from 14 to 48, which was very, very high. And it meant that I needed an intervention where there were so many options and, um, as to whether to go to the hospital and see a doctor or see a, pro, a, a herbalist who came to have all cures for, for cancer. But of course, I went to see a doctor. And then uh, I realized that it was a time that I had an intervention because it was getting out of uh, 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 if I wasn't careful, I might probably get in a problem. But luckily for me, it was 
uh, localized in the prostate, and therefore I had brachytherapy and followed up with radiotherapy. And then my PSA, which was 48, went down to 0 0.17, and now it is 0 0.15. Wow. And uh, I, feel, I feel quite healthy. Fantastic. So, um, uh, Doc, how old were you when you first found out? Well, I was then about 58 years old. But I stayed on, as I said, you know, I had the later on the brachy, uh, that is when I was um, about, uh, uh, that, that, that was exactly after 10 years, 13 years. And then now I am 74 plus, but Amazing. I feel quite okay. I don't Amazing. seem to have any problems. Fantastic. What what um doc? What is a normal um, what is a normal PSA for men? What what is supposed to be normal? So you know we in the US we've set uh, a PSA of four as a cutoff. Uh, so below four is normal, and above four is elevated. That being said, there is a lot of um, things to consider in that, um, especially if you have particular risk factors. Um, there are some people who have suggested uh, adjustments of expected PSA based on age, because as you do age, in some people, your PSA will gradually get higher. So sometimes four might not be the best cutoff to use, but typically we'll say four. And when it is above four, uh, we usually get referrals from the primary care or GP uh, to the urologist um, to talk about what we do next. Um, so that is kind of what we typically do. And the PSA is just one part of the picture. If you're diagnosing prostate cancer, a PSA can be elevated by itself for many reasons. Infection, somebody who's had a recent catheterization, somebody who has urinary issues in terms of retaining their urine. So a lot of times, if we just look at the PSA in isolation, it doesn't give us much. So we also do the rectal exam, which a lot of people will get from their GP to feel the prostate for any abnormalities. In addition to the PSA and the rectal exam, if both of those give us a high suspicion that there's something going on, then we do the biopsy, um, as uh, she had uh, this mentioned earlier. And the biopsy plus the PSA and the rectal exam give us the complete picture in terms of diagnosing uh, a cancer. Okay. And um, Dr. Guam, do you have to do any of those apart from the uh, blood test? Well, then I didn't hear you where. Did you have to do any of the yeah, rectal? Could you repeat, please? Did you have to do the rectal examination or a, a biopsy as well, or was it the PSA blood test? Yes, yes, I did both. Okay. The rectal examination on a number of times, probably about six. Okay, okay. And how was are you put to sleep? When is the, uh, the rectal examination? Are you put to sleep? Or how, how does it happen? Because it must, it sounds very painful. Or it's not painful. Oh, well, yeah, a little bit. But something that as soon as you leave the hospital, the pain is over, you know. So, I, I mean, it's, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's painful as such, you know. Yeah, it's bearable. Okay, okay. And Doc, how, were you able to tell your family straight away that you know you had prostate cancer. How was the side of things as well? Well, I didn't get you where, but well, I'm the sort of person who doesn't hide her problems. Almost every friend of mine, male friends, got to know of it, and then through that, a lot of people have also had tests. But in my case, I should have known that I was prone to it because my father, I lost my father out of that, two uncles and a cousin, you know, so it is genetic probably, I would say. And therefore, uh, I should have known and then probably tested earlier, 
which I didn't do. So, so I tell other people to test as early as possible 45 years so that if it is found that you are getting prone to it, then something can be done rather than waiting until you get it. And again, as I said, I, I don't hide my health problems. And uh, otherwise, I might probably have ended that with uh, that spiritualist who practice like a doctor in a way. <laughs> you know, but I realized that uh, that was the wrong thing to do. But a lot of people are doing that. You know, they are going for herbal medicines, some of which don't work. Probably some do, but I'm not really aware. You know, so I advise my friends, other people, you know, to do the right thing. You know, go to the hospital, see a doctor, have a test done. And then if you there's a problem, well, you are likely to get cured rather than uh, staying at home or going to other places where one is not sure of uh, the sort of treatment one is going to get and the end result. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Susan, I see you nodding your head. Do you see a lot of, um, you know, people coming in that they want to try out herbal stuff before maybe going into surgery? Have you come into contact with, you know, African people or black people that have come that, you know, I, I don't really want to have surgery. Um, I've been told to take this kind of medication that it would help. Have you had that um, um, situation before? Hold on a second. I'm just going to unmute you. There are some, absolutely, and especially of sort of um, African heritage, yeah. I would say. Not too many in the UK, I'm really, really pleased to say. Um, but unfortunately, as uh, Doctor mentioned, you know, even when there is a national screening program, unfortunately for some people, the black community don't tend to be... Um, very keen on partaking and seeking this help early. Um, it's a problem. So, we, you know, there's been a lot of research done, but we've, we've got to try and do more to break down these barriers. I mean, I will have some very interesting conversations with people and some people will opt for not having any treatment at all, even when their urologists have suggested that they would come to harm at some point in their lives if they didn't have treatment. And I think that it has to be very much about doing your best to give information at a level that that individual can understand to try and maybe encourage them to think differently so that they can do the right thing for them. But unfortunately, what we do know is that there is no homeopathic or alternative medicine or herbal treatments which compare to conventional treatments for cancer. And it can be something that can be life-threatening. Yeah. Do you think the reason why a lot of men are scared to one, have a test and two, have surgeries is the fact that they may not be able to have erection or have sex anymore? Because obviously that's a, a, that's a huge part of their, their lives, you know, that they won't be able to have, you know, um, sex with their partners or whatever. Do you think this is the issue that is affecting black men from maybe having tests or having surgery? Yeah, um, definitely. Um, you know, when we have our discussions about surgical interventions, uh, I always mention the two most common side effects of a radical prostatectomy in terms of what most patients are going to get. One of them is incontinence. Um, difficulty holding their urine um, because the prostate has an effect in terms of continence and helping you maintain that and you take the prostate out. And the other is erectile dysfunction because alongside the prostate are the nerves which supply uh, the erectile tissue. So when we take out the prostate, you know, we do have the option of trying to spare those nerves, but most of the time, especially if the disease is more advanced, we have to take those nerves as well. And then we inform patients that, yes, your erectile function can possibly return in maybe six months to a year, but there's most likely a, a likelihood that it will not return and you may need some type of assistance from this point forward. And that could be um, oral medications, but sometimes those don't work and we have options in terms of escalating that uh, the, the options for that. But I do think it's a, it is a fear 
um, that a lot of men have. Uh, I will say a fair amount of men will say, well, you know what, I'm already old, it's okay. But I don't make that assumption because, uh, you know, it doesn't, that, that doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Susan, anything to add on to that? Well, yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. And I think that's, that's so true. Sometimes I'll be talking to a man who actually is in his 40s or 50s and is due to have a radical prostatectomy. And sometimes I say, you know what, I want to see my kids grow up. I want to get rid of this cancer. Actually, that isn't going to be the most important thing to me. And I'll have other men I speak to, as doctor says, in their 70s, even 80s, who are like, oh, this, I can't risk not being able to have, have a sexual relationship. So you have to be very careful. But yes, absolutely, it is a worry for the majority of men. Let, let's be honest, it absolutely is. Um, as doctor says, um, it's very important that men get support um, in finding out what they might be able to access to try and help them improve their erectile function. Again, as doctor says, if we've been able to carry out nerve sparing surgery, then they have got a slightly better chance. That's no guarantee, but it can take some time. And sometimes just understanding that and having that support, because you can imagine if you've gone through having your prostate cancer diagnosis, gone through treatment, um, and then worrying about whether you're going to be able to have a sexual relationship anymore, how that's going to affect your your relationships and your whole being, your, your manhood, you know, all these things. Psychologically, that's not going to help you get an erection because obviously you're stressed about that too. And that is something that's very lacking in the UK. Uh, we've recently set up um, um, uh, sort of um, sexual support service. We recognise that there's a big hole in the UK for men to get support on this very this important area. Um, and we don't see people face to face, but if they've had treatment, uh, cancer treatment, then we're trying to work with them. And I think just the fact sometimes to be able to have that psychological discussion is helpful. But as Dr. says, there are many things that can be trialed if people have access to it. But it's also getting those men sometimes to talk about their um, distress at perhaps not being able to have normal or sexual relationships as they had in the past. And some older black men they might ask this question literally eight to ten years after the surgery because they've been afraid to mention this within the clinic environment. So it's, it's really strange. So that's why being able to talk to us over the phone on email or live chat is so good because they don't have to see us. So that's a really good way of trying to support men without having this face to face sort of, you know, feeling uncomfortable or, or shy about that. Um, the other thing that I would just mention is that. Um, Obviously, you know, when you talk about the sexual side of things, it, it's so much, it, it's not just the physical thing, there's the brain, there's the, the sort of psychological influence as well. Um, men can no longer actually ejaculate. I'm sorry, Dento, is it okay to say these words on yeah, here? No, please, yeah. Thank you. When men have um, surgery, they can no longer ejaculate. And sometimes when they have radiotherapy, they either have very little ejaculate or sometimes no ejaculate. Some wow. men struggle with that but they can still have an orgasm, they can still climax. It may not be the same as previously. And of course, you know, um, it, it's difficult if they're having a problem with an actual erection, even though they can orgasm, some men would still struggle with this. But I think it's really worth mentioning that. Yeah. Um, some men um, are able to still have penetrative sex if they're lucky enough after a period of time, after I've tried to protect me. And with radiotherapy again, there can be some difficulties with erectile dysfunction. Um, slightly, would you say, doctor, slightly less in incidence than radical prostatectomy, especially if it's non-nerve swearing, and later, coming later, after treatment? Yeah, I would say it's, it's yeah, it's probably comparable to the rate of non-nerve sparing, though I'd say maybe mm -hmm. a little bit higher in my experience with the radiation because you kind of can't avoid the uh, radiating the absolutely nerves. absolutely so yes there, there are very there are various aids to use i know you know not ideal but there, and then there are men who come out the other side and they are able to enjoy a sexual relationship in other ways so i think it's very important that they have the opportunity to talk about how they're feeling and get that support which hopefully we can offer within the charity which in the nhs sometimes they're so up against it that they don't necessarily have the time i'm sure doctor in, in the us is, uh, also has time 
uh, restraints as well. But so that's one thing why we're very, very lucky. And sorry, I just want to say one thing Dr. mentioned about the threshold of referral in the US with the PSA being four or above. In the UK, yeah. the threshold is actually lower. So just to, just to that, you know, that men are, aren't um, confused by that in the UK. So if they don't think there's an infection present or inflammation, obviously, which is called prostatitis, which is not um, cancerous in itself, um, if the PSA is three or above, then that would generally generate the referral. Just I just wanted to mention that because sometimes GPs aren't always completely au fait of the referral level. Yeah, 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 brilliant. Thank you for adding that, Susan. I really appreciate that. And then also just, do you know, like with breast cancer, we are looking for a, a lump in our breast. You know, when we say, what is, is there, is there a lump that comes around? Like what, apart from, you know, doing a blood test, is there anything that you know, pops up on the body or, you can say, you know, it's prostate. Is there any inflammation? Well, I think we, as we kind of mentioned a little bit earlier, it's difficult for somebody to diagnose it themselves, especially when it's early on, because it's going to be asymptomatic. If somebody is having symptoms, then the first thing that pops into my mind is that we're looking at a pretty severe disease because um, typically you won't see symptoms, as I mentioned, the back pain, the bone pain, the weight loss, um, sometimes blood in the urine, difficulty urinating. These are very nonspecific symptoms, but if they have a sudden onset um, and you haven't been screened and you have the risk factors, then that's the first thing that pops into my mind. So I think that, you know, we ideally like to see people before they have symptoms which is why it's important to screen. This is not a disease you want to wait to fit, to have some type of symptoms before you see a doctor, because if you've gotten to that point, it's most likely too late. And none of these surgery or radiation options are what we're going to reserve for you. At that point, you would need more systemic therapy and the outcomes are not as good when we can catch it early. So there are symptoms, but they should not be, it should not be a mindset of waiting for symptoms before seeing a doctor in this regard. Thank you. Um, Susan, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I mean, you know, absolutely. And I think this is why it is so essential that we make sure that black men are aware of this increased risk, that they're in this high risk group. Because if they're not having symptoms in early disease, which is typically as, as, as we're explaining, if they're not aware of their risk, the danger is that things could become more progressed and they would have absolutely no idea until things had become um, a, a much more severe and more difficult to treat as a consequence. Um, I've spoken to too many black men in their mid to late 40s with prostate cancer because of this. So I think that's incredibly important. The Digital rectal examination, that's where we will examine the prostate, as doctor was mentioning, with a gloved, lubricated finger. Um, literally, that takes seconds. Okay. Um, something that's not happening at the moment because of the coronavirus. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So um, what we don't want is for men to put off making contact or having this conversation with their doctor. Um, because of this situation, they can still have a telephone consultation to express their concerns, even if they're not having any symptoms, even more so if they're having symptoms. Um, and they can still have this blood test done as long as they're understanding the advantages and disadvantages of this test. It's very important that it's an informed choice and they understand that you can't use the PSA test in isolation to diagnose prostate cancer. This is so important. Um, now, the rectal examination, not all GPs do it, even when we're not in a COVID-19 um, pandemic. Um, but it can give us some more information, as doctor says, it's another part of the jigsaw, which, which I often talk about, um, because unfortunately the PSA can be under three, and you can have around 15% of men who will still have prostate cancer and hasn't identified that. So to do a digital rectal examination in the back passage, which takes seconds, about 4% of prostate cancers, I believe roughly, can be diagnosed from feeling that prostate feels hard or, or lumpy, nodular, we call it. Um, 
you know, again, that can't be used in isolation either, but it's another helpful bit of the jigsaw. So, so you know, where possible, um, it would be good to get this done. Well, not at the moment, we have these restrictions, but it's something that a lot of men are really quite worried about. And that's why it's so important that we plow money into research to try and find better ways of testing men to develop a national screening program, which is specific, sensitive, um, and, and hopefully in the future will be less invasive. And as Dr. knows, there are a lot of things in the pipeline, very exciting things that hopefully it's not going to be, you know, with, we may be talking for more years, but it's, it's, it's on the horizon. But at the moment, this is all we've got. So we, black men cannot wait. Yeah. yeah. To understand this high risk is crucial. And in order to um, that we have this, it's about encouraging the black communities to talk to each other. It's not easy sometimes. There's a cultural problem. There are cultural obstacles to talking about prostate cancer, as Dr. says. We've got to encourage wives to talk to husbands, daughters to talk to fathers. We've got to encourage these conversations within our black communities. We've got to stop so many black people from coming to serious harm due to this terrible disease. Absolutely. And have you have you thought of maybe targeting the women? Um, so that the women can encourage the men. I don't know. I'm just thinking. I'm just thinking because I feel like no. the women, like maybe the men, are worried that you know about this sexual stuff. Where actually, I'm not worried about the sexual stuff. I'm worried about you staying alive <laughs> and you being here for our children and our grandchildren. You know, is there a way that we can actually put this? I know women are getting so many, so many things on us, but is it another way to encourage the woman? To, to fight for the men? Well, um, one thing that we've got in the practice of doing uh, where I work is we typically have the wives come um, for the appointments to, you know, even after the initial diagnosis, we don't let them, we don't encourage making any decisions right at that time. We say, hey, go home, here are some resources, show them to your wife, talk about it. And when you guys come back, you know, presuming they have a spouse or a partner and they're comfortable coming with them, bring them in so we can have a very shared decision. Because as you have implied, a lot of the men will be talking about the erectile function. And I think there's a big disconnect between the importance for men and women with regards to that. So some of them, the man will start talking about and, she, and then she'll interject and say, wait, that's, that's not an issue. And I think it's a very important to, to identify that because there's always, I say, more times than not, it's a big disconnect between the man's expectations and the woman's expectations. And as you said, she's more concerned about the, the, the spouse being alive and being there and being able to provide. So I think that it's, it's, it's very important. You know, we don't want to obviously put all the burden and the onus on the wives. And sometimes I say, have come with your whole family. Sometimes they may have a son or a, da a daughter who is medically inclined, but I like to make sure that everybody is involved because we talk a lot about shared informed decision making and a lot of times men will just say yeah whatever you say doc but it's not that type of conversation we really have to make sure you know the risks benefits and the implications of whatever treatment you decide to do so that you'll have good outcomes after everything is said and done absolutely um can i just um dr kwame did you involve your family in 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 your process Yes, I did. Every one of them, my wife, my kids, everybody was aware up to now. And they know all the protests I've gone through. Because I don't hide my health programs, as I said. Not if, if I don't hide from my friends. And of course, I wouldn't do that, you know, from my immediate family. Doc, why do you think it's an issue in our community? I mean, I touched on, you know, maybe it's the sexual stuff, but... You know, are there any under, other underlying factors that are inhibiting our black men, our African men to go out and, you know, have the test or have surgeries or, you know, um, just find out more information about the prostate cancer? Yeah, 
what to me oh sorry i didn't okay i think it's more of awareness yeah a lot of people don't seem to be aware i mean when you tell them it looks as if that's the, the the first time they are hearing of, you know. So if they are, get aware that one can get treatment safely, uh, at minimal cost, then of course a lot of people will get, get it done for them. You know, rather than, as I said earlier, you know, looking for cheaper, uh, uh, ways of getting uh, out of it, which doesn't work. I mean, through herbal medication and so on. So basically, is the awareness creation that we are lacking. Okay. Doc, can you hear me? It's the awareness. I mean, so how, I mean, I'm, I'm glad that you as a person, you sound like you're somebody that has been championing it in your own, you know, in your own corner, educating the men around you um, to speak about it. And is it, isn't it very, very expensive in Ghana to have the treatment? Well, in a way, yes. And then close will be no. Because I went in for uh, the best that I, I, I thought of, you know, which meant having the full. Oh, Doc, we've uh, lost you. Say, uh, say that again, please, Doc. We've done, done, what, what did you and they done? followed up with uh, uh, the radio therapy. You know, but I, I don't know much about this, but I suppose there are other ways of doing it without going through all that I, I did. And then that might be probably cheaper. I missed a few of that. I don't know whether anybody but, caught that. But again, uh, mm -hmm. I suppose, I mean, if we were to have fun, the issues that could uh, 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 are you guys struggling to hear uh, doctor as, as well as me, right? Yeah, it's yeah, cut off a little bit. Yeah, unfortunately. it's it's breaking up. Uh, doctor, I'm, I can't I can't hear you. And it's a very important message. I don't want to I don't want anybody to miss it. No, 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 no. Um, it's not, it's not working. Uh, let me see whether he'll come back on. Um, can you see this question on the screen by Seth? Yes, I can see it. Can you answer it, please? Uh, so typically, um, you know, I've definitely heard some patients uh, mention this, uh, to my knowledge, there's not any research that uh, supports this uh, systematically, uh, maybe anecdotally, uh, but uh, once again, um, the risk factors uh, are a little bit more important to consider than any kind of maybe non-potential uh, way of mitigating the disease. Um, 
So of course, there's nothing wrong with doing that. It may uh, not help your cancer much and it may be beneficial to the relationship, but uh, I would say, um, once again, uh, do not use any of these in place of screening. Mm -hmm. I think I, I, when I was doing this research and just asking around um, people's thoughts and stuff, what did come out was that um, the men were saying, yeah, it's because, you know, the women are not giving us frequent sex when we need to. Apparently it says that, you know, sometimes I don't know whether it's just a joke or whether they're actually being very serious about it. That, you know, they, you know, it says that, you know, they're supposed to have, men are supposed to have frequent sex um, and when they don't, this is what happens to a man and they get, they get prostate cancer. These are some of the issues and topics that the men are discussing um, behind closed doors. Yeah, I mean, in my experience, I've heard that before. Um, again, there's so much we don't know about the disease. So I can't just, you know, uh, blindly dismiss that. That being said, um, we definitely have patients, you know, it'd be very hard to study that, but we do have patients who uh, <laughs> say, yeah, you know what, doc, I, I used to have sex or intercourse all the time and I still got cancer. How'd that happen? Because I thought that's what you do to prevent it. So oh. once again, it speaks to the point that, you know, this may be anecdotal, this may be a clever ploy, uh, whatever the case may be. Uh, uh, I don't think we can in good faith say, okay, this is how we can prevent prostate cancer. Thank you. Thank you. Susan, do you want to add anything to that? Is, have you heard that? Uh, yes, sometimes men will ask us um, um, uh, such, a, such a question. But what I would say, if both people in the relationship are happy, then carry on. Because mm -hmm. if it's going to prevent you from getting prostate cancer, as doctor says, we have no evidence to, to, to say yay or nay. So mm -hmm. we... we we, we we don't know we the, you know what it's like in conventional medicine unless we have um <laughs> evidence-based studies and, and you know um randomized and we just we just don't have that information and i think it'd be really quite difficult to actually uh not everybody would be telling the truth about the frequency of their love making shall we say so yeah <laughs> we we don't have that evidence but it's it's something that's not going to hurt you so Carry on. Absolutely. Thank you so much. So back to Dr. Kwame, if you could just finish off your statement that you was um, so, um, you know, you were sharing with us, because I think it was very, very important, but we just couldn't hear you. Nope. Doc, can you hear me? Has he, has he frozen? He's frozen, I think. Yeah, because he's a bit still, isn't he? Oh, yeah, it's, oh, it's his reception. This is bad. Oh, that's such a shame. Um, okay. How is that? How is cancer likely to progress without treatment? Um, so I guess. I'll speak on this as well, but I think she'll have some some insight too. But uh, it in black men um, with a family history, for example, it's a recipe for disaster if there's no treatment because it will progress. It's not a matter of if, but when and how fast. Um, and uh, it, it you know there are people who may have a very low grade, low risk prostate cancer. We can't know until diagnosis, but they're the people who will never have any issues may never get screening and maybe after they've passed away and they've you know done an autopsy for one reason or another they'll find that the gland has cancer in it or sometimes when we do procedures for patients um, to help with the urination we might find cancer incidentally um, so there are people who have low risk cancer and nothing will happen to it it will never progress it's not going to be what causes them issues later in life but you can't, you know, we don't like to roll the dice on that because I can only tell you that after I've had all the information and I've done all the diagnostic testing to say you have a low risk. So it's very hard to just say, I look at somebody and say, even if they have no family history, even if they're not African-American, they can still have a high risk prostate cancer. And I will never be able to just, you know, have a crystal ball and say, 
Yeah, if I did, it would save people a lot of uh, testing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder, so it does, Doc, does it have anything to do with food? I feel like, you know, the other day I had a conversation about fibroids in, 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 in you know, African women. And again, it's very high in black women, you know, and you're finding that, you know, prostate cancer is high in black men. Is it something that we are eating? Is it, I don't know, why us in a way like that we, we, we get to have all of these kind of issues? It's, it's very hard to say because of course, every cancer is very different. And there are some cancers where we know there's a clear dietary uh, etiology. For example, colon cancer, the link between colon cancer and red meat has been proven. Stomach cancer, the link between stomach cancer and excessive raw fish intake has been shown. Uh, for prostate cancer, we don't have that. We don't have a clear link or a clear relationship. Um, that being said, you know, there's a lot of theories and there's a lot of research that's, you know, somewhat promising that says, you know, it's related to inflammatory markers. And these are things that can be elevated with high red meat diets and, and, and relatively unhealthy diets in this side of the world. Um, there are some people that posit that because of the chronic stress that a lot of, you know, African Americans face, you know, it it uh, can impair the systems that would normally help prevent genetic abnormalities, which can lead to cancer. But once again, a lot of these are somewhat early research or research that's been inconclusive. So for me to say as to why, I think that's the million dollar question. You know, I think a lot of times what we have shown is that sometimes it's lack of access. You know, a lot of people to see the doctor in the US, not so much in the UK, but you can, I'm sure she can, uh, can speak more to that. But in the US, sometimes if you don't have insurance, you're very disinclined to go see a primary care doctor. So that way it's just, you're not gonna access the system until you become symptomatic. And at that point it's too late. So a lot of, you know, the US has, not as effectively as the UK instituted screening programs nationally, but you know we're definitely still lagging behind. There's definitely people who have been lost because of this poor access, which tends to be higher in the African American community, US. Yeah, thank you, Susan. Do you want to add anything to that? I think you know it, it, it's likely that there is a, a multifaceted sort of. Um, approach to this it may not be just one thing in isolation just just it's just interesting that the ethnic groups who tend to have a lower incidence of, of prostate cancer are those perhaps of asia for example but very interestingly um for example if you apparently if you emigrate from say japan where they have a low incidence to the us eventually they say that that man likelihood of being diagnosed with prostate cancer becomes the same as somebody living in the US. Oh, wow. So, so, so you know, we've got this idea of, yeah, there's got to be some sort of genetic link. Um, you know, as doctor says, is it due to sort of some sort of inflammatory response? Again, look what's happened with the blessed COVID-19 outbreak. Again, Black people have been found to be at significant harm from that. You know, they, so, you know, and as we know, we've got, as you say, you know, increased hypertension, high blood pressure, sorry, um, um, increased cardiovascular problems, heart attack, stroke within black people. <laughs> Absolutely. So we're unlocking more and more doors, but it's likely that if there's an environmental influence and it be that dietary or be that something, much wider than that that we can't control i i, I don't know i don't we don't know we don't know mm. uh, so you know yeah i i absolutely agree and i think that's why <laughs> obviously we have personal um reasons for 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 being but it isn't just us I mean, for example my charity that i work for i'm just so impressed i'm absolutely being honest here i'm just being honest and genuine with you yeah. you know that they're absolutely passionate and committed to trying to reduce the harm to the black population that we see because they are our high risk group. So that's really admirable. So we are on it, basically, and we're gonna fight Absolutely. to we can find out more information. But we need the black communities to work with us. Yeah, absolutely, we do. We all need to work together to kind of 
um, spread the news out so that you know our, our people can get the test done as early as possible. Um, and and Doc, you know when um, and it is it's also you know when you have maybe the surgery, are you off at work for a long period of time? You know, are these factors as well in terms of like you know maybe they're the breadwinner and they're worried about not being able to go to work. How will the impact on your uh, lifestyle when you do get the prostate cancer? So I think, you know, when you talk about impact, you're, you can divide it into the immediately, the immediate post-operative period and then what life is going to be like going forward for at least maybe the next six months. So immediately post-operatively, like many other surgeries, we do recommend being away from heavy labor, like heavy lifting and strenuous activity for approximately six weeks. Um, but typically our patients will discharge in the hospital the day after the surgery if they've had a robotic surgery and maybe about a week after surgery if they've had a traditional surgery. But regardless, we still recommend kind of having modified activity for the six week period. Um, and then, you know, most patients can go back to work. So if they work a desk job, you know, uh, as long as they feel that they can go to work and the pain is controlled, um, then they go. One thing to mention is that when you do have this surgery, you're going to have a Foley catheter in place. It's the catheter that's going to drain the bladder, and that will typically stay for up to two weeks. So I know some patients don't like to go to work with those things in place. You can wear them portably, of course, but some patients would rather just stay at home until then. But every some patients say, you know what, I need to go back to work as soon as possible. But I always advise if your work involves heavy lifting, the employer should be able to offer you modified activity to do at work rather than your traditional job description until you feel that you're you recover it to an extent. And like I said, we usually wait about six weeks. Now that's immediately, as I mentioned, the most common complications of this surgery are erectile dysfunction, but incontinence as well. And the incontinence can range. For some people, it's very mild. For some people, it can be very significant in that they're leaking a lot. Um, typically, all men will have to have some type of pad or underwear liner initially. And most of them will start to recover their continence over time with exercises which we can prescribe and just time for things to heal. But for some people, it becomes so bothersome that it's, they're always leaking. And to be at work in a situation where you're doing lifting, or you have to be sitting for long periods of time, it can become intrusive and very difficult to manage. And we do offer those patients, especially if the leaking hasn't resolved after approximately six months, some further options for helping manage that. So I think I can understand that some people are apprehensive to pursue treatment because of the potential to have those type of side effects. Yeah. But again, uh, it's also important that they know that there are options for them if they do get to that point where it's interrupting with their daily activities. Thank you so much, Doc. That's very, very helpful. Susan, do you have anything else to add to that? Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And, and generally we see that um, after a radical prostatectomy, the surgery that we're talking about, the removal of the prostate, normally most men, it's temporary and it's resolved between one and six months. We tend to, would you agree, Doc? It's, it's, it's about, about that sort of time frame, And and maybe you, you can find that, you know, there are always going to be those men, sadly, who's going to have more longer term, but actually around 5% maybe after a year would still be having problems. Would you agree with that or roughly? It's quite low, it's quite low. Um, but yes, I, I think it's it is definitely a big undertaking. And if you're if you're actually having treatment as a younger man, I mean, I don't mean that it's okay if you're retired. Of course, it isn't. But if you're a younger man and you may be the main breadwinner and you're having to go to work, you know, as you say, and you, and you, you know, you, you, you know, it's very important that men get the right information about where to source appropriate incontinence wear that sort of thing that won't be seen from the outside that sort of thing because you're right I mean you know it must be it's a difficult thing to prepare yourself for let's be honest it really is isn't it you know no matter how much you're told to be completely confident normally prior to having your surgery and then to be having those problems consequently and as doctor yeah. says incontinence will range from 
dribbling. So we expect it, we tell all men to expect it, to be honest with you. Some will be very lucky, they will just have dribbling or more of a stress incontinence when they move, cough, sneeze. But as doctor says, some men will literally have no control of their bladder whatsoever. And wow. that's what we get a lot of calls from men in that situation. And that's what it's really good for them to pick up the phone and talk to us and we can reassure them and talk through things that they can do to try and help themselves at so pelvic floor exercises. Um, which is what the doctor was mentioning, um, all these things. I, mean, I think it just emphasises that it's not just the treatments. It's very important to have really good support in place psychologically and physically and to have access to that support. That's also crucial because there are an awful lot of men living with and after prostate cancer. And, 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 and in terms of mental health as well, I mean, you, you touched on that. Do men get the option of having, you know, uh, to see a mental health person to talk about this? Because it is a big deal. It is a big thing. Um, it's a total change of life um, to what they, they they knew before. And so, especially in your charity, Susan, are you incorporating a mental health side um, to this? Well, we realise how important it is. You know, what we will do is we will do national surveys. So we really want to hear from, from the men and their relatives that are going through these treatments so that we are responding to their needs and, and their desires. And a lot of the calls and emails and contacts that we have are in relation to um, emotional, um, the need for emotional support. Now we're not trained counsellors, we're all trained nurses, but we're not trained counsellors. But to be honest with you, sometimes just than somebody who understands the sort of treatment that you've been through, having that ability to be able to offload and talk in great detail and depth. I don't know if, if, if doctor, you found that after your treatment, if you had some support um, available to you, but that is incredibly important. And yes, a high percentage of the telephone calls that we have are for emotional support. We tend to signpost to various organisations. Unfortunately, within the UK, there are very few um, clinical psychologists available for patients who have cancer. They are absolutely gold dust. And of course, most patients wouldn't necessarily need that level of intervention. But, you know, they might rely on their urology specialist nurses or speak to their urology doctors. But it's not as, uh, you know, how a man feels emotionally isn't always something that as a sex, they're very good at, um, at, 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 admitting, at admitting to, to be honest with you, in my experience. And also there's, a, there's another aspect of this as well. We mentioned hormone therapy, which is um, an adjuvant treatment very often with um, radiotherapy. And men can be on hormone therapy for various lengths of time, sometimes just six months. But for some men who have advanced prostate cancer, where the prostate cancer has spread to distant areas of their body, they will be on hormone therapy for life generally. And the hormone therapy um, is given to block or lower their testosterone levels because we know that prostate cancer typically grows in the presence of testosterone. But actually, hormone therapy can also result in a man having a low mood or being really emotional when they've never been before. And it can lead to anxiety and depression as a result of that as well. Again, it's an area that needs um, more time spent. It's, it's a need out there which isn't being met adequately. We do our best to meet that um, within the service. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, Dr. Kwame, can you hear me? You're on mute at the moment. If you can mute yourself, unmute yourself. I can't seem to unmute you. Uh, Doc, Doc, you have to unmute yourself. And for everybody that is watching whilst I wait for Dr. Kwame to unmute himself. Um, if you have any questions, guys, this is the time to ask your questions to our panel. Um, I know a few of you have uh, 
put you know uh, um, some questions up please don't forget to share your pages somebody may need this information as well make sure that you share your pages so everybody can see this typically we usually have about at least four thousand people watching i know that the numbers are down i know that the men are hiding but i will get this information to you wherever you are i'm going to be promoting this on facebook to make sure that the men get this message um you know we usually have so many people watching but um i can see that the numbers are very low today and it's simply because we don't want to hear about it we don't want to know about it and you know i am going to push it down everyone's throat um this video um after it's done so thank you to all the panel members for joining us if you do have any questions please let us know i'm going to be wrapping up in the next five minutes because they everybody has busy schedules um doc um alfred has put this up is this true oh hold on a second let me unmute you oh no you have to un okay yeah, got it. yeah. well so, I he didn't hear it, right? right okay okay no okay let me let me go to dr kwame now i have dr joseph <laughs> before you answer this question now that i can hear him doc um oh, what question did i even ask him please um anyway let me let me let me say to you you know what would your words be uh, to some of these men who are watching the show now? What words of encouragement, what inspiration would you tell them uh, about prostate cancer and about the importance of getting tested? Well, I, I would advise them not to be frightened, but rather be bold and go for the test. And if there's a need for any intervention, they should face it and have it done because it is better, better to survive uh, uh, dying because one is afraid you know, to go to the hospital for treatment. It could be frightening, but the end results will be better if one seeks the right treatment and get it done. And what would your advice be again about herbal medicines as well and getting proper treatment? Well, there are a lot of herbalists who claim to have cure, but I rather advise those who want to go for herbal treatment to go to the right places. For instance, there are medicines that have been approved you know, by the Food and Drugs Board, herba, herba drugs, and they may be all right. Or we also have a, a herba, a few herba a, 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 a clinics that have been accredited by the right uh, uh, sources. But to go to anybody else is not advisable. But with all that, I would prefer that they see that doctor for advice before deciding as to what to do. Okay, thank you so, so much. I really appreciate you coming on to speak and share your journey and your story. Um, it's an honor to have you on. It was a struggle to get people on. Um, and I hope that your story that you have shared will encourage somebody else to go and make a, to do, you know to go and do a test and to also encourage somebody else another brother um, to go and do a test because I think that is really important as you said the awareness the awareness the awareness the awareness needs to be more I'm thinking you know are we supposed to be starting to teach this to our kids I don't know you know um, when, when are we um, like should, when should we start speaking about this? Um, it should be at an earlier stage than, you know, when people are 50 or 55 and they go and do their test. I think that we need to be talking about it now. And these are the sort of platforms that we need to be using to encourage people um, to speak about it. Um, so joined late, but any medication. OK, so Eugenia says joined in late, but any medication. Most of the patients I know are under uh, Tam. Sulucent capsules, is that correct? 
Yes. Um, so tamsulosin is a, what we give people. Um, it's called, also called Flomax. It's a medication we give people who have urinary issues. So that's a little bit separate from prostate cancer. That's for people who are having difficulties with urination. And I believe that's an effective medication for that purpose. Um, for the purpose of prostate cancer, it may not be, it's not something that we would use, see as a treatment. Um, this is more just if you're having difficulties in that uh, regard. And do they have to take medication regularly, like every day to help them throughout their life after you know having prostate cancer? So uh, as Susan had mentioned, uh, if you do have a history of metastatic prostate cancer, so cancer that has spread, part of the treatment regimen initially is to do hormone therapy. And in hormone therapy, there are different formulations, but what we do is we do, we do an injection therapy, which they receive every six months. Um, sometimes they may need to take some daily pills initially before we start that, but it's not the pill, it's not an everyday medication, but it is a medication that they usually get every few months um, to help with the symptoms. Um, and this is for, once again, just to kind of keep the disease at bay. It may not, these uh, injections may eventually not be, uh, not continue to work. And then we just start thinking of more of chemotherapy and those type of interventions. But in terms of an everyday medication that you have to take, no, not typically. Okay, all right. Um, Susan, do you have anything to add before we wrap up? Um, we recognize in order to reach the black community, which we've already discussed, there can be some obstacles to actually um, taking good care of one's health. You know, it's, it's very interesting. Some guys are really happy to go to the gym three or four times a week, which is good. But when it comes to actually our health, well-being, they're not quite so interested in that. But we have got out there. We've attended things like... Um, Simmer Down Reggae Festival in Birmingham, and you know places where we know we're going to be meeting um, our target audience. And what was interesting is that um, you know, like we had a tent there. Just to give an example: we had a tent there, and people just weren't coming in. So you know, my colleagues actually went out there with their booklets and their leaflets, and then people would engage. So you have to think of ways of overcoming these barriers. Um, and we have really good association with some um, some fantastic black celebrities, people that people really respect, and they can be really influential. So that's another way that we're able to break down the barriers. Um, you know, for example, Rudolf Walker is a very strong supporter of ours. Patrick Truman in EastEnders, I'm sorry, gentlemen, this is all UK stuff. Um, I wanted to say also, if I may, we have a one-to-one -one service at our charity. This is where men who have had prostate cancer or have prostate cancer, you can arrange, we can arrange for you to speak to them over the phone. They don't give medical advice, but they talk about their own experiences. So if you're making treatment choices, this can be useful. And it can be very useful for asking those questions that sometimes men are reluctant to ask a healthcare professional. You know, just maybe a sexual thing that they might be able to talk about their own experience. We do not have any black men or women on that one-to-one -one service. So if there's anybody who is at least one year clear of having treatment, who is from our black communities, and they perhaps would like to do this, it, it, it's, it's, it's basically just making a couple of phone calls and speaking to somebody else. And, and people, there's 100% satisfaction from men who speak to these volunteers. We give a little bit of training, you know, for confidentiality, all these sorts of things. But if anyone's interested, um, I've just popped a, an email there, if you would be so kind, oh, thank, thank you so much. So if, if they'd be interested in being a one-to-one -one volunteer, we would really welcome um, black members of our community, please, to come. And that can also be a wife or a partner as well, who supported somebody through prostate cancer. And um, for some people, they would prefer to speak to somebody of their own ethnicity. So yeah. that's that option. So again, another way. And I would just finally like to say apologies. I'm just so passionate about this. You know, I hope we haven't painted Dr. Well, I have too much of a bleak picture about this. Um, because, you know, I speak to so many men who have had their treatment. They're so glad that they've had their treatment. And Prostate cancer is no longer the thing that they wake up worrying and thinking about and go to bed worrying and think about. They've got a quality of life back and they're loving life. Yeah. It is possible. So it is worth it. 
Absolutely. Thank you. And I think that's so important um, for you to mention. I think that's crucial um, so that men don't get scared and have fear that there is a positive side. And the positive side is that when you do get tested early, you can cure it, you know. Um, There is that positive side as well. Absolutely. And thank you, Denta, for raising this very important, you. Um, you know, profile. This is this is crucial. Thank you. And then, so um, uh, uh, before I forget, the alkaline doc. Can you answer that question? Because the person has messaged us again. Yeah. So I think again with the, uh, uh, you know, my what what I am familiar with with the alkaline diet is that a lot of the. Uh, recommendations with that diet are generally good for your health. Um, are they specific for prostate cancer? Not necessarily, but I think once again, I always encourage people that, you know, also think of the bigger picture. If this is a heart healthy diet and it's going to help with your weight, um, we definitely recommend it. You know, I think that sometimes we, we get to focused on is this going to prevent cancer, but I always focus on this, this is going to prevent heart disease, this is going to prevent stroke, these things that are killing at a alarming rate as well. Um, so it may have some benefits. I can't say conclusively if the benefit is related specifically to prostate cancer, but if it's a healthy diet, then I think go for it. I always say that with any time there's herbal remedies or anything like that, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not against complementary medicine in that you're using it alongside, as long as you've if you're taking any prescription medications, make sure with your primary provider that they don't interact with the herbal medications and they don't influence how they work. But there's nothing wrong with taking them um, concurrently, but I also encourage that, that doing that alongside having seen your doctor and knowing what your options are from a traditional st medicine standpoint as well. Thank you, Doc. And do you have your final word before we go? I think just to echo uh, what Susan was saying, I think it's uh, the most important thing here is recognizing that, you know, there's awareness, recognizing that there is this disease, recognizing that as a African-American man, you are at a higher risk. And I think that the things like this help demystify, you know, prostate cancer and the things around it, because there's a lot of misconceptions and a lot of time that's enough to deter people from uh, pursuing treatments. So I thank you for having a forum like this. I think it's been very useful. It's been very productive. And it's something that people can refer to whenever they do have questions or they want to know about their treatments. And a lot of times, you know, unfortunately, there might be a negative interaction with a particular provider or something like that. So this is something you can reference as a, hey, maybe I should seek a second opinion, or maybe I should consider something else somebody else in terms of my treatment. But I think that having the information and being armed with it, you know, you can make an informed decision and you can not allow somebody to downplay the severity of the disease or your risk factors for this disease. So I think that, you know, do not let it let yourself be deterred from treatment because of lack of knowledge because it's been provided to you. And do not let yourself be deterred because you're scared of the outcomes of what happens to people. We've just we've had the opportunity and the privilege to talk with somebody who's been through this, is on the other side, and is now saying, you know what, just face it with boldness. And I would echo that uh, uh, comment as well. Absolutely, absolutely. So, Doc, Dr. Kwame, any last words for our viewers who are, who, who are watching eagerly this evening? Yes, I will still put emphasis on early awareness in schools, in mosques, in churches, and so on, and also accessibility to treatment. That is also very, very important. So with these two, I think we can go a long way in preventing and cutting down prostate cancer. Thank you all so, so very much for spending your Sunday evening and afternoon with myself. Um, I hope that you have enjoyed the show as much as I have. I've learned so much and trust me, I am going to be going out there to spread the message as much as possible to make sure that we get all our black men going in there to have their tests done. Thank you so much for the work that you continue continue to do susan you know over 30 years 20 years in, in, in the nur nursing i mean that's fantastic um yeah, doc, so much. well 
We appreciate you. And also, Dr. Kwame, thank you from the bottom of my heart for being on this panel. I really appreciate you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, I hope that you have truly enjoyed tonight's show. I have really, really enjoyed it. I have been so educated um, on, 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 you know, prostate cancer and what men actually go through. Um, sometimes we don't know what people are going through. And that's why I always say that we must be kind. We must be kind all the time because you don't know what somebody is going through somewhere. Um, somebody could be sitting there and they're going through so many things. They're, you know, Life has changed for them, but we don't know why. And so, guys, be kind, be nice to everybody. Everybody has their own situations and things that they're going through. Again, us women, let's encourage our men to go and have tests, just as we have our regular testing, um, our smear tests and all of that, and our, you know, breast checks. Let's encourage our men to also go to the doctors and have regular checks. Um, and I also encourage our pastors, um, our churches, let's talk about this in the service. It's really important. This is the way you guys have the numbers at times. You know, you have the congregation. Sometimes 2,000, 5,000 people are sitting in your auditorium. Let's use these tools to educate people and because you have the medium to do so. Um, so let's do that, guys. Let's encourage one another and let's educate one another. I hope that, you know, people will share their pages. Somebody somewhere may get blessed with this message. Um, again, again, thank you so much to World Remit for sponsoring this show. Join over 5.7 million people who are sending money worldwide to loved ones. And a thank you to Prodigy um, for your beautiful spices and shit off. Guys, make sure that you go out there and support the cause. To everybody that continues to watch the Dentist Show, thank you so much. On Thursday, you will see me with another blast, another educative um, topic that we will be discussing. And again, you know, on Sundays, it's social Sundays. Okay, take care, God bless, and I'll see you very, very soon. Bye-bye.